Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I welcome you all to the next session of Research Scholars Day, the annual research festival of IIT Madras. RSD 2021 has started with a wide range of events from lecture series to interactive talks and workshops to competitions. It aims to bring together people from different research backgrounds and encourage exchange of ideas and research interests. It gives me immense pleasure and honor to welcome our speaker for the session, Dr. Ramachandra Krishnaswamy. Thank you for joining with us here, sir. Thank Dr. You. Ramachandra Krishnaswamy is a leading aerospace and mechanical engineering consultant, a chartered mechanical engineer, and the former director of the gas turbine research establishment, DRDO. He has over 35 years of experience in eminent R&D sectors and eight years of teaching and training experience. He has steered prominent projects <coughs> in the Hero Engine Kaveri for the light combat aircraft, the marine gas turbine system, and the small gas turbine systems. He has launched several science and technology projects related to gas turbine engines, including the new gas turbine technology initiative, which has a project outlay nearing these 100 floors. Under his leadership, several major certified test facilities required for certification of aero engines were set up in the country, including the Advanced Aeronautical Material Testing Laboratory, Hyderabad. He is one of the architects of airworthiness certification process also. Sir also has a major contribution in the field of metal additive manufacturing, including stereolithography and FDM-based rapid prototyping techniques. He has received planned and established the state-of-the-art rapid prototyping facility at the GTRE. The title for his today's talk is Research and Technology Challenges in the Development of Futuristic Propulsion Systems for Fighter Aero Engines. Now I would like to invite Sir to deliver his talk. Over to you, Sir. Uh, sir, I think you are on mute. Okay, oh, very good. Thank you. Thank you for reminding me that. Uh, and I must thank you for um, giving me this opportunity. Uh, I'll, without much ado, I'll start sharing the screen. Uh, and that is there. Um, I hope. I hope you're able to see the screen. And I hope I am audible. All right. Uh, I, I, I sort of uh, had a peep into the previous lecture. And unlike that uh, sweet talk, uh, this presentation is going to be a, a rush uh, because the, the topic is so vast. And uh, what I propose to do in the coming 55 minutes or so, I will go through a series of uh, PPTs and explain to you the context of looking at the technology challenges. Uh, and this is therefore um, the, uh, the, the pattern of this presentation. It's going to be a talk with reference to, um, uh, with reference to uh, this topic, and I hope this uh, screen is visible, and this is the full screen. I must again uh, say thank you very much. Thank you, uh, the Dean Academic Research, and of course the team of this um, uh, the the this, uh, the um, anchor um, uh, of this of this theme. I mean of this topic today, and um, what I do quickly do would be looking at. Um, the you look at the, how we've been chasing the mirage of technology gaps. Uh, we will look at a few winding technology gaps and expectations with reference to aeronautical systems and aerothermodynamic analysis and some design challenges with reference to the engine systems. And the most important thing is the materials and manufacturing processes. There are compulsion, there are very big opportunities of a few systems. I'll briefly touch upon those things. And there are issues with structural technologies. I'm sure uh, most of you are from IIT uh, research centers uh, research um, the faculty, and I'm sure most of you are uh, uh, aware of all these things, but I'll, I'll make a passing remark on each one of them. Uh, each instrumentation and controls, uh, uh, maybe the role of AI uh, and the machine learning and data sciences in uh, handling uh, propulsion systems and some uh, technology concepts for advanced propulsion systems. And of course, the industry uh, academia participation, we will have a quick look at that. And I'm aware where IIT Madras has a research, many, many research programs, and they're all multidisciplinary and interdisciplinary, you know, as she was mentioning, previous people were mentioning, and enlightened guys and girls, 
Uh, and you're also not restricted with just academic excellence. You're also getting into product design and development. And therefore, this presentation will summarize the perceived needs and research opportunities. And look at probably the technologies with, whose channels are below what is uh, uh, required. And therefore, we will look at them. Quickly, therefore, uh, a roundup of uh, the fighter aircraft and aero engine in the Indian context. And we are very proud of this uh, vehicle, the Tejas, which has been delayed, and um, but it's now into uh, into services and a big production order. And there are other issues, other other systems which have been developed. We must be aware of all this. I'm, I'm just repeating for the sake of continuity. And we have several other aircraft programs going on. And today we are talking about going beyond um, these. Uh, these aircraft systems. We're talking about AMCA, the advanced medium format aircraft, and uh, and of course the the un, uh, unmanned combat air vehicles. And we have done a, quite a bit of work in, in developing uh, propulsion systems for these vehicles. And the brief mention of these things. And today we are talking about small turbofan engines, and of course the the helicopter engines for from HL. And we are talking about UCAF engines for UCAF, and notwithstanding all these things that are going on, we are looking at for ahead for the fifth generation aircraft, aircraft engines for AMCA, the Advanced Medium Combat Aircraft System. And they are, st uh, they are highlighted by stealth and very low observers. So these technologies, and this is of course 11 kilonewton uh, thrust class engine. And we are looking at this. We are already late. If you look at the scenario global, uh, we have got already systems which are up on the test, test beds and development. And they're also being deployed for many, many applications. So there is an exponential demand for small gas turbines for missiles and UAVs. And if you look at uh, options available, there are many, many uh, uh, systems abroad. There are options of import, but we have now done uh, quite a bit of work on small gas systems too. And pretty soon, pretty soon we are going to have these things as platform technologies. So we need to be able to support uh, entrepreneurs uh, small, uh, small, in, small scale industries to take up these um, these engine programs. Now there are, of course, there's a spin off technologies uh, coming from um, from the civilian side. But what is important is the need and the role of propellers, propeller turboprops, which we are not uh, spent time on. There is time. This is the time for us to wake up and look at propellers, turboprops like this to handle. A civil and transport aircraft and cargo aircraft and even defense applications. Now, therefore, if you look at uh, the whole scenario, we have done enough uh, on the, in, the, in the front of in the, in the, uh, the technology front as far as the gas turbines concerned. We are expanding them into marine industrial gas turbines, small gas turbines, and so on. So the whole uh, uh, spectrum is available. But what is uh, intriguing? What is important for us to use see is we need to jump in the, in terms of thrust to weight ratio from a meager, very low value of eight to nine or 7.4 to nine. We are going into a 15, that's the weight ratio of 15. And today it can even reach, uh, for example, if you look at the, the forecast uh, that's been done through the versatile program, uh, Wate, uh, we are talking about just to weight ratio of 20. And this is quite a big challenge and we need to get up uh, provide ourselves. We, had, we didn't have the advantage which other uh, equipment manufacturers, the gas turbine manufacturers had their technology readiness was always much better, much higher than the requirements for the engines which they were trying to build. Whereas we, uh, if you see the, uh, I'll take a minute to get the laser pointer, and there we are. Now, if you look at our scenario, the requirements are much higher than our readiness. And you take any field, whether it's materials or manufacturing base or testing infrastructure, or even the, 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 the design know-how, the, the skill, the design skills for the, for the, for the uh, people, uh, we, we didn't have that facility. We are now therefore always chasing, chasing, and we have to parallelly build all these technologies. It is historical, but then I thought I'll take a men make a mention of that here. Uh, and therefore, let's look at the for short term and long term research goals and technology development challenges. We look at the, <coughs> sorry, give me a moment, if you don't mind. If you look at, um, Principally, the technology is uh, driven by materials and manufacture. Uh, quite a bit of that, of course, internal flows and leakages past the, <coughs> past the components inside the engine. The design of the component itself is only about 
So much of the focus has to be toward to the materials and manufacturing technologies. And I'm sure we have learned a lot of lessons. And a few of them are this, that we didn't have a, 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 a mission profile, well-defined mission profile or throttle excursion, the way the pilot used the aircraft on the engines. We didn't have the, the benefit of being prepared. Uh, as I said before, materials and basic manufacturing processes should be there with you uh, much ahead of a, a possible start of the program. And therefore, this, this, therefore, we need to fill this gap. This, this is where our discussion today will be concentrating on how to be prepared uh, preemptively. And we also one lesson that we learned is that the margins in the design of the engine system should be much more than what the aircraft needs. And the design of the component should have much more um, uh, in, in, ter in terms of, uh, um, shall we say, margins again, or the engine system. So the engine should be better than the aircraft and the component should be better than the engine system. And that's a hard lesson that we have learned. So let's look at some uh, aerodynamic design challenges. So look at fan and compressor. The first thing that comes to my mind, I'm sure the guys who, who are working in aerospace departments and re related um, research activities, the flutter, which is the combination of air elasticity, aerodynamics and structural dynamics uh, is a major, major concern. Even today, in spite of uh, systems being flying, uh, uh, systems flying in, 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 in the aircraft, we have to understand. And this uh, is compounded by the fact that the engine doesn't have a clean air like a transport aircraft engine. Uh, and therefore, it is having an intake, which is a very complex S shape in front of the engine. And this gives you a lot of distortion. We have done enough on this. Our TRL, the technology radiance level in this is quite, quite good. It's above, above five, it's in fact six or seven to start with. And therefore we need to concentrate on, as for the aerodynamic concern, the flutter and inlet distortion uh, and, uh, of the fans and compressor blades. And if you look at combustor, combustor works well. We understand combustors, they work very well at the, the, at the ground level uh, testing stations. But if you look at the profile, the, the altitude versus Mach number of the aircraft uh, and therefore the engine, the, this uh, combustor system, including the afterburner, should work at all the major corner points of the profile. And this is something which we, we have not really um, uh, concentrated on properly. And therefore there are uh, here uh, jinx here and there. And therefore we need to have the operability of this. Uh, we, we don't want the uh, combustor to shut down, uh, to frame out. Uh, and the SFC uh, should be dictated at all the corner points. So our ability to do the CFD to simulate these corner points, uh, the orders uh, mission points uh, is something which is um, worrying, but we have a good CFD uh, ex experience and our TRL for this is about six. But what's not uh, diff what's difficult for us is to control the temperature. The combustor output should be as clean as possible. It should be a flat profile, but in, in practice it happens that radially Along, along the, the radius of the, the turbine, for example, the temperature is not uniform. There is what is called radial pattern factor. And also around the circumference of the, 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 the combustor or the turbine blade, the temperature keeps varying. The, the, therefore, the radial pattern factor and the circumferential pattern factor need to be very clean. It cannot be more than 10, 12% or 18%, as the case may be. But in, 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 in our case, our starting point is so good, so rather not so good that we burn the turbine blades because the temperature is quite high. It could be as high as 35% of the average temperature. And therefore, the pattern factor, the way you, you put in uh, the, the, the cooling air and connect and, and cool the, uh, the out, output from the combustor is so important that we need to put in a lot of effort. The added to this is our inability today to simulate to predict the temperature, metal temperature, on components like the turbine blades and the combustor liner when they're coated with the thermal barrier coating. So the, the conjugate heat transfer, the, the, the internal flows, conjugate heat transfer, especially when there are uh, ceramic coatings, oh. the thermal barrier coatings, uh, and these are something which, which, are, which are not good that we need to, I'll skip this uh, 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 point, uh, but therefore today we need, as far as combustion is concerned, a, con a concern a focus on stability at mission corner points. Engine should, uh, should not blow out and the blow out character should be understood very well. And maximum turbine temperature, exit temperature should be controllable. It should be, therefore the radial and circumstantial pattern factor 
should be um, handled. Now, turbine was obvious to say, it is common sense to say we need more efficient combustion turbine blades, and we need to have uh, high speed, high temperature uh, turbine wheels, turbine blades, uh, they're dictated by materials, and of course, aerodynamic design. But today we are talking about removing uh, possibilities, uh, a sort of out of box thinking. Can we remove the, uh, the LP turbine without sacrificing uh, the performance of the engine and turbine system? And this, of course, means that the two shafts of the engine, if it's a two, two spool engine, should rotate in the opposite direction. There are other issues connected with this idea uh, of, um, of removing the uh, veins. Uh, that is, the bearings will be affected and uh, the, 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 uh, the lubrication system will have to be revisited. But today we are talking about already uh, removing uh, veins from both the turbines, both the LP turbine and HP turbine in a typical two shaft engine. So there are a lot of thinking that, that needs to be done. Well, therefore, the, the, the focus for as far as the turbine is concerned, can we have high efficiency, high temperature turbine going beyond 1900K? And can we really look at the possibilities of uh, veinless turbine stages? Coming to the back end of the uh, thrust vectoring no uh, of the engine, the thrust vectoring nozzle. The nozzles are typically uh, coaxial, but today we have we are trying to use a thrust vectoring nozzle. The nozzles which rotate, which bend up and down or uh, uh, rotate circumferentially, which gives you a very high mobility, agility for the aircraft. We can make tight maneuvers, tight turns, and also use um, short uh, uh, runways for takeoff and landing. And therefore, there's several possibilities. And today, we don't know what is there. We're, we're at the crossroads. What type of the spectrum nozzles should be done? Should it be mechanical? Should it be flat? Uh, uh, put in uh, thrust practice like this. It is. It it it, it means a lot of uh, system studies and analysis. Or could, could it be uh, is uh, three sixty degree three uh, axisymmetric um, thrust vectoring, which will give you pitched uh, roll and yaw control and uh, enable aircraft to do a lot of maneuvers. And today, I'm sure in IIT in Madras and anywhere else, there's a lot of work going on on fluid thrusting, fluid thrust vectoring, and thereby introducing fluid from outside. We can bend the thrust, thrust axis of the engine, but this is limited to small, small. Uh, experimental engines, but can this be upscaled to actual engines? So today the, the question is, uh, what about 2D and 3D circular uh, thrust vectoring nozzles? Uh, what about the materials for this? And can we really look at fluid thrust vectoring nozzle and, up, and scale it up to um, real requirements? The, the crux of the whole engine technology today, as I said, is materials and manufacturing, the process and simulation technologies. We have advanced composites, and I think we are doing a reasonably good, we have used uh, the polymer matrix composites for the front frame and the uh, oh. combustion bypass casing and, and the, and the, and the, and the, and the um, uh, external flaps of the system. But mind you, the engine is a system which handles foreign object damage, and therefore these polymer matrix composites for the front struts need to be reassessed, and we should have a viable design and manufacturing technology. We're not done well in metal matrix composites. For example, if you have titanium as a matrix, can we introduce silicon carbide um, as a reinforcement, either fibers or particulates? And this gives you a major temperature and uh, weight advantage and life advantage, but we are not done much. Our TRL levels is only three as far as this is concerned. And even um, ceramic matrix composites, which are there at the back end of the, of the engine, where the thrust vector nozzles, are, the, the, the engine nozzles are there. These flaps, these converging and diverging flaps, as well as the, 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 the NGVs, the veins, and the combustor liners, they're all going to be made of uh, silicon carbide, silicon carbide, ceramic matrix composites. And today, let me assure you that without these uh, three types of composites, we can't do an engine, a contemporary engine, uh, uh, for, for an application like the AMCA, AMCA. And, uh, and we don't understand, the reason for that is we don't understand the failure mechanisms of these metal, um, ceramic matrix composites. And uh, we don't know how to join them together. The joining technology between two ceramic CMC parts or CMC to a metallic part is not understood. And the, we are having design codes today, which are more empirical than actually data-based, it's very scientific. And if you want to do an optimization, we need a lot of, lot of data to be generated. We need to understand the failure modes mechanisms 
uh, and also, uh, for example, the way they behave when load is applied at different temperature. And we must be aware that the fracture toughness of the ceramic matrix composite is quite low. It's about uh, 15, uh, it's about five to 15, as compared to 15 to 150 of metallic materials. So this is something which we must uh, keep in mind. And there is an urgent need to overcome this big gap in CMC and technology, the ceramic matrix composites technology. We need to have a design methodology, uh, established manufacturing processes, joining technology, and we need to understand failure modes and material properties to be generated to make the designer comfortable with his design options. And then uh, it is also today possible to look at, uh, look at metallic materials. For example, high temperature uh, materials like inconel and irumet, IN 709, uh, and the element 720 are the materials for, for the turbine disk. And if you look at turbine, typical turbine disk, I'm sure those guys who are uh, working in propulsion technology will understand. I, mean, I, don't, I don't need to look at this. The rim is very hot because the combustor exit uh, temperature impinges on this blade directly mounted on this tree. In spite of the stress concentrations there, the stresses there are quite low, 400 MPF typically, for example, uh, whereas the temperatures could be as high as 600 degrees centigrade, or it could even be 700, 720 degrees centigrade, depending on the type of combustor that we have. Whereas the bow, and therefore it is very creep critical because high temperature and long duration of exposure makes the rim very creep critical, creep deformation takes place there. Whereas the bore, which is the center part of the desk, the hub of the desk has a very high temperature and stresses, 800 MPA, maybe 900, depending on the type of uh, loads that we have, depending on the material. But the, the temperature redeeming factor is temperature is quite low, 400 degrees centigrade. So the temperature is low, but stresses are high. And therefore this area becomes pretty critical, pretty critical. So you have a desk, which is pretty critical at the, at the bore and creep critical at the rim. And therefore, whichever is weaker at the end of that period of time, we throw the disc out. Uh, and therefore we lose a lot of, lot of um, uh, benefits of the, of the disc uh, much earlier than what we should be doing. And therefore there is a possibility today. So let's take the same disc and put it into a, uh, into, a, into, a, into a heat treatment furnace, so resistance heating, heat treatment furnace, and have fixtures to keep the uh, temperature in the center of the uh, disc, the bore of the disc high, and on, on, on the outside you heat the rim. But uh, once it is stabilized, you pull that thing out and you cool the rim very fast, keeping the disc at the center, the temperature at the center of the disc uh, the same. Uh, we don't allow it to cool down. And when you, when you, when you finish the heat treatment process, you will see astonishingly, the rim has got a very high uh, grain size, maybe 50, 45 micron thick, uh, big size, whereas the bore is thin, a uh, very small grain size, which is good because um, the high grain size of the rim gives you good creep properties. And the, the very fine grain at the bore becomes uh, very good in terms of fatigue properties. And you would expect about 20 to 30% increase in the life of the part. You don't have to throw it out as soon as one of them is limited, is reached. You make them reach at almost the same time and 30% augmentation in the life of the thing is possible. And what I said was the process which are uh, resistance heating furnace, a lot of fixtures. We did a, a, a very uh, uh, quick uh, analysis and some uh, simulation of using Induction heating systems, uh, there, there are no fixture or nothing, is held in space. And you have induction coils uh, of different power rating, and the gaps between the disk and the induction coils are changed. And it's so programmed to give you what is really required for a good uh, optimized disk. For example, if you did uh, an experimental cut up and looked at the f microstructure, uh, which is 45 at the rim and about five or six at the at the bore, we can get the same thing through the simplified induction heating process. You can see it is it is it is um, uh, similar, similar in, if not exactly the same. So there is a possibility uh, of getting this through simpler induction heating processes, but uh, there are some residual stresses which creep in, and therefore we must uh, develop technologies for creep fatigue life optimization of turbine disk. Mind you, the turbine disk is most expensive in the whole engine. Uh, it could be several crores, uh, depending on the complexity. And therefore, you extend the life of these parts through this simple heat treatment process, which is good. 
um, the heat treatment process me, uh, makes use of the differential grain size heat treatment, and then it has to be done for both inconel material, salmonite and udimate. Now, look, looking at the life of disks, we go to the front end of the engine, which is the compressor and the fan, the blades are inserted into the disk slots, and these are very high stress concentration factors, and this makes the disk very, very thick, and very big. Whereas if you, uh, there are early fatigue failures here, which can be avoided by making the blades integral with the disc. They're called IBR, the integrally bladed rotors or blisks. And this of course can be machined today uh, with the Francis milling machine in one go. And that, but then a very, when the sh shapes are very complex, uh, there could be a limitation. Today we are talking about employing uh, using what is called the linear friction welding process, where the two parts are made to press against each other, and there is a gentle high frequency movement and uh, creating local stresses go up, and uh, local friction go up, and temps go up, and it fuses the parts together, and you get ultimately this product, which is one part. If there are 80 blades and one desk, you get the 81 parts typically in a, in a conventional design, but here I got only one, one part, which is an integral part. You can see the aerofoils are milled, and then this part is uh, attached to this desk through linear friction welding process, and bingo, you have a single part, single blisk, uh, which is good. But we are now going from blisk, uh, which is uh, very advantageous to uh, uh, or what is called blinks. We'll come to that later. Do we don't have a simulation possibility? We don't know how to uh, design the parts for friction welding, non-linear friction welding. You must know how much uh, material is lost, what is the temperature, what is the heat affected zone, and how to reduce this uh, stresses through good heat treatment process. So this is something which you must do. We are very bad at it. We are not started in a big way. And therefore our TRL levels should be improved to do that. I mentioned about bling. What is bling? If you look at uh, the conventional design, independent blades and discs, which, was, uh, which is going to be replaced by what I said as IBR, where the blades are integral with the rim and the size, the shape of this becomes smaller. And you get a, at least 30% reduction in, uh, in the weight of the part. But today we are going to talk about a bling, the bladed ring, where there is no web or a, a, a hub like this. It's only one small ring of titanium for here like this and the blades are in, in position. But the, it cannot do a very high speed uh, uh, performance. And therefore you strengthen that with uh, the, uh, the silicon carbon, any, any ceramic uh, material, silicon carbon um, uh, here, which is going to be fused. And this is the technology. This is something we, uh, we don't know how, how to insert this ring inside titanium matrix and fuse them together through maybe a diffusion bonding process or maybe an equivalent process. And this is something which we must uh, really uh, be concentrated on. And tomorrow, when we want a thrust to weight ratio of 20, it's not going to be possible without the help of these sort of uh, gadgets like blinks. So today's uh, requirement, uh, today's focus should therefore be on linear friction welding process, the heat treatment process associated, and bonding of ceramic rings in titanium matrix to achieve what are called blinks. And this is the, the, the present technology and a future technology as well. And therefore, um, uh, we, will, we will go to the next part of the manufacturing process. I'm sorry, are you give me a minute, I'll just... Sorry about that. Uh, so then the, there are uh, coatings uh, which are important. If you look at the engine, uh, it's a plethora of coatings, uh, hundreds of them coating all over. We don't notice them, but they're doing all sorts of uh, functions for each, at each location. And one important thing is the coatings which are there on blades. If you typically look at a compressor or the fan, uh, the blades are made of titanium because we need uh, low weight um, uh, parts. And similarly, the casings are also made of titanium today. And if you look at the temperature in the compressor area, it could be anywhere in between 300 to 600. And the pressure in the, in the, in the compressor area is about three and a half to maybe 25. And so the, 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 if there is a, a, a problem with the growth of the blades, a malfunctioning of the spool, there could be a blade, blade rub, blade to uh, casing rub, which will result in titanium being, uh, uh, being 
are being uh, released and this gets ionized and there is an imminent explosive um, fire and you must lose the whole engine and perhaps the aircraft. So we need to be looking at preventing titanium, titanium rob by having a blade tip coating. It looks very silly, but it's a, such a thin blade. The tip of that is so thin. You must be able to coat uh, the zirconium, the zirconia on this and also coating on the inside of the casing. So the titanium is prevented from rubbing against each other and we prevent uh, the possibility of titanium fire. You can see what really happens within a few seconds if the dead titanium rub, the whole casing is burnt out. We are lucky if the casing burnt out, it didn't explode and it can happen if you don't do it properly. So today the context is uh, we must develop zirconia coating on the blade tips. This is a technology. We've been trying this very hard, but we need to develop technology and certify it and test them and certify them. And that's the important thing. There's another coating, we're talking about coatings, which are important for the, the uh, engine system. And that is uh, to prevent ice forming on the, uh, on the surface of the, uh, frontal surface of the engine. Uh, when you're flying at a particular altitude and a particular uh, Mach number, uh, the, the local condition, the, the, the dispersion of water, the, the humidity in the, in the system uh, will result in a very quick buildup of ice which will affect the performance of the engine because the surface is going to be rough. But worst case is the buildup of ice like this might result in the ice being dislodged and it will enter the engine and it's going to be a, a huge foreign object damage and you will lose the engine itself. So there are a necessity, there is a necessity today to have uh, coatings, but we are trying to do this with um, uh, local electric heating with power drawn from the battery of the aircraft and also, uh, we, we some use the compressed air uh, to uh, heat the system whenever you encounter uh, ice in conditions. And this is done today manually or through very, uh, very uh, rough, very, uh, shall we say, uh, digital yes or no type of controls. Um, but that can be avoided. Total wastage uh, can be avoided. And uncertainty can be avoided by having what we call as a hydrophobic coatings, hydrophobic coatings on the surface, which are vulnerable to icing. And it, it very similar to, for example, the, the lotus leaves on in which water doesn't uh, stay and it gets washed into. And this uh, can prevent a lot of water. And the weight of the engine can come down. The control system can be simpler by having a reliable hydrophobic uh, coatings, dependable hydrophobic coatings and paints. And there are methods already available, but they're not very effective. We need to improve upon the durability and the reliability of the system. We look at a few structural technology challenges and we are designing today the engine on what is called a safe life philosophy. We test the parts, we test the material and we know what is the safest uh, temperature, safest uh, stress and stress excursions that will result in a damage to the component. And we know that number and beyond that number, all the parts which are uh, very expensive manufacturer from the same batch shall have to be removed and inspected. And if even one of them has failed, a, a 0.8 mm crack has developed in any location in the part, the whole bunch, say for example, you have manufactured 200 discs uh, in the same batch, all 200, all the 200, um, uh, 200 um, uh, components have to be thrown out, which is uh, simply a stupid thing to do. It's not very cost effective. Each one of them may be a couple of crores, depending on the complexity. And therefore, today we are launching, we are talking about what is called damage tolerant design, which is fracture mechanics based. We should understand how the cracks propagate, even if the crack has developed, how they propagate, what is the rate at which and the direction in which the cracks grow is very deterministic. Whereas the safe life method uh, of uh, looking at the life of the, uh, of the disc based on low site fatigue design criteria is more statistical lower bound. And therefore, we tend to gain a lot of advantage, cost advantage, and the life cycle cost of the system goes up tremendously. But the, the catch is we should understand the materials, we should understand the components, and we should understand the behavior of the component with reference to the existing or already developed cracks or uh, defects in the system. It could be cracks in the bore, it could be corner cracks, or uh, defects uh, sitting dormant inside and they grow. 
And the, the way they grow depends on the temperature, the, the, the cycles of loading, and the, 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 maybe there are some tracks which are close to each other. They're a compounding effect. So we should understand the whole fractional mechanics behavior of the system. And therefore, to enable damage tolerant design methodology, we should develop full, complete fracture and crack propagation data for the entire set of uh, engine machine cycle parameters and materials and for all materials. For example, it could be titanium, it could be internal, it could be urium, and it could, it could even be some ceramic composites. And, and we should, it's not enough if you do the material evaluation, we should develop component test data to component test program, which is sadly missing. Associated with the fatigue failure uh, or the safe life is what we today ignore as the um, fretting fatigue, fretting wear. And therefore, what is fretting? I'm sure most of you understand that, but the, the parts which are there, for example, like a blade and the dowel root sitting in the, in the desk, undergo cyclic uh, loading due to temperature excursion. And there is a, there's also a vibratory, vibratory, uh, vibratory uh, load superimposed. Uh, you, please pardon me, uh, that, that, that system is howling. I will ignore it for some time. Now then, um, this uh, superimposed uh, low cycle fatigue and high cycle fatigue load on the contact points here introduces very high flank stress uh, a very high flank stress, the hurt stresses here. And this is bad news because the surfaces are actually uh, rubbing against, uh, gently rubbing, uh, they're in sliding velocity and very high contact uh, hurt stress there. And this results in local fatigue failure, fretting fatigue failure initiated, and then it goes into a full scale low cycle fatigue or high cycle fatigue mode of failure. And we don't understand fritting very properly because it involves coefficient of friction, temperature, uh, and the sliding velocity and so on. We ignore that because of ignorance. We have a fudge factor or ignorance factor. We are now designing these parts, these locations here on uh, empirical empiricism and uh, experience-based numbers. And the idea today is if you have a design stress, stress here, which is less than, 40% of the yield stress at that point, and, uh, at the temperature, we are supposed to be safe and avoid fretting fatigue. But this is not true. In spite of all this thing, there are fretting failures are, uh, uh, there, and it's very difficult in complex cases. For example, the splines joints in a, in a shaft, the, the flange joints, which are very complex uh, bolted joints, they all undergo fretting fatigue. And therefore, we need to put in a lot of, lot of effort in looking at the simulation. Can we simulate these, um, uh, these, these factors in a, in, a, in a typical, for example, analysis mode? Can you predict at what point in time, given the coefficient of friction, going the sliding velocity and the type of load that's coming on, uh, can we predict the onset of uh, fritting wear or fritting fatigue, track initiation? Today, we don't have the facility and you can see at the, right, the top there, the TRL, the technology readiness level for this is only two. But there are efforts going on elsewhere. And this is something which we need to be concentrating on. So we have design methodology exclusively for fretting fatigue, which we have ignored all the while, uh, apart from the empirical uh, design method methods, we need to be uh, concentrating on. And fretting simulation capability we have to augment. And there are testing methods, there are certification standards for this. We need to develop those things for, for this. And of course, the additive manufacturing is the buzzword this today. And it's a realist, it's a real, a real situation. We have very big opportunities. There are serious limitations as well. If you have to go from uh, reducing thrust to weight ratio of increasing thrust to weight ratio from existing 7.5 to 8 to 15 or 20, we need to reduce the number of parts. If we have to integrate a few parts and build them into as one part. And this is possible today uh, to, uh, the entire thing can be done through additive manufacturing. But it's foolish to really take recourse to this additive manufacturing without understanding. Definitely not the rotor parts to start with, but at least in the other non-rotating parts, can we categorize uh, those which can be taken up for um, additive manufacturing to reduce the weight, to reduce the integrity, and make the assembly disassembly faster? Mind you, the uh, uh, additive manufacturing technology is also being used very effectively for repair. Uh, and MRO activities of the parts. And therefore, we must identify the parts which are very uh, susceptible and e easily amenable to additive manufacturing, but 
we need to uh, characterize, perfectly characterize materials, machinery, and the skill of the personnel and the methodology, the process parameter. There are umpteen ways the, our additive manufacturer part can be built. The build style, the, 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 the power rate, the power setting for the lasers and so on. So all these things should be uh, certified. And we have a lot of mechanical properties and physical properties uh, that needs to be built to be able to safely put this additive manufacturer part in an engine. It's one thing to put in a, a pipeline in, in a typical uh, automobile uh, manifold, but it's very different for, by, uh, for, for putting this uh, additive manufacturer parts in an engine environment. So therefore the identification of parts to be brought under additive manufacturing regime, uh, we need to do a lot of characterization and data generation for different build styles and different materials and so on. And of course, this I'll skip this, uh, thought I will make, make a mention. Uh, internal flows is a major, major criteria. Uh, it's about 25% of the whole engine activity is dependent on how good your internal flow estimates and how the, uh, the, the, uh, the, the, the temperature prediction based on uh, conjugate heat transfer. And if you look at the way the engine, uh, this is not an engine industrial gas turbine, which uh, sort of uh, keeps running at the same speed for a very, very long time. And therefore, if you really do a good uh, estimate of the, the, the gaps, the gaps between rotating parts and the static parts, you can have even a well takeoff, a pinch point, where there's a possibility of a rope. And similarly, when you do a lot of throttle excursion, there are possibilities of rub, but more importantly, there are possibilities of gaps widening, which affects the performance of the engine, which affects the efficiency of the parts. And there could even be some catastrophic failure. You must have heard about this oil loss into the bearing housing and the bearing housing catching fire. So all sorts of things can happen. So we must have a good uh, capability uh, to predict the internal flows, but more importantly, we must invest time and effort in sealing technology. The, uh, there are seals, very many types of seals, but what is today uh, happening are the, the, the brush seals, which, which is an important thing. Now, having said about this, uh, uh, the, the efficiency of the, uh, the, the, the gaps, uh, the estimate of the gaps between, there are a lot of issues in more with creep and fatigue life. Today, we are talking about uh, temperatures which are beyond 1900K, and therefore the temp temperature of the combustor liner, the temperature of the blades is going to be very, very high. We need to have a very cool, good cooling uh, mechanism to reduce the temperature to maybe 1100 degree K, uh, 1100 degree centigrade. And we have materials which, which are not capable of going beyond that. So we have equaxed uh, high temperature materials, um, basically nickel based and uh, cobalt based materials. And, but then we have uh, different uh, grain structures I'm sure I'm repeating what you people might be know, would be knowing definitely. The, linear, the directionally solidified systems, uh, and of course we have single crystal blades. Obviously, the creep behavior of these three different types of brain structure is different. And today we have the comfort of using single crystal blades uh, to increase uh, the creep resistance of the material of the blades of the components uh, beyond uh, what, what is comfortable to you. But how to predict the creep fatigue interaction at those temperatures uh, been, and when you, the loads are cycled, when the stresses are cycled, we have uh, quite a bit uh, different types of um, behavior. Some of them are isotropic hardening, kind of material, and I won't go into the details, but they basically behave as viscoplastic material. Visco, uh, there's a viscoelastic or plastic behavior. And all this needs to be integrated to be able to predict creep fatigue interactive damage and there are very many models available today. And we have to put them all into uh, very closely and be able to predict the onset of, uh, of uh, uh, damage to the part, to uh, turbine blade or turbine vein. And today, our major area of concern should be to put the algorithm in place, which will absorb these material behavior and the damage mechanisms. And that needs to be the priority one, as far as the lifing or uh, the es estimate of damage and the life of the engine parts. And therefore the development of uh, so-called Chabosch model, for example, as one, one example for viscoplastic behavior, damage accumulation mechanisms and uh, to en enable creep fatigue life assessment. And there are several uh, uh, artificial intelligence. I will not go into the details today because we are short of time. We already have 15 minutes left. And therefore we'll go to a quick a foreign object damage apart from creep and fatigue where the impact 
uh, the, 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 the engine can, in, in, in the course of a flight, um, a low level flight, for example, birds can get sucked in, uh, ice can, ice slabs, ice cubes can get in, sand and water can get in. But impact of a bird, 0.8 kg bird hitting the engine front uh, in, a, in, a, in a typical takeoff mode, about 150 meters per second, means 15 tons of additional thud in a few milliseconds. And the whole thing gets transferred to the mounting points, the bearings, and the engine case and the static structure. And we don't want that integrity to be lost. We also have a transient thrust loss because there is an aerodynamic disturbance because of the debris of the bird, which gets us chewed into, uh, into a, a spiral inside the engine within a few fraction of a second. And the blades also get deformed. And then this can result in a total engine surge and a flame out. We have a problem because the requirement is that if engine uh, were to be hit by blade, say one kg or 0.8 kg bird, we want the system not to disintegrate. But at the same time, if the thrust falls, it shall not fall below 85%. And it should also recover within uh, five seconds to at least 85%. And therefore, these are very stringent requirements for the integrity of the engine and the safety of the engine and the aircraft. So, but this is dependent on our ability to understand the high strain rate uh, behavior of the material. They are not the same as what we get from a simple tension, tension test. And that's not a very low strain rate. High strain rate could be as high as 2,000 to 5,000 strains per second. And the behavior of this material, of the titanium, for example, and the front of the engine, is so much dependent on the strain rate. And therefore, we need to understand the strain rate and the behavior of the bird itself, the bird material, and the ice material. Today, we have a fair and good understanding of the bird material, which is hydrodynamic. It is solid, semi-solid, at low speeds. But at speeds of impact, about 150 meters per second, for example, it behaves like water. It's hydrodynamic. There is no shear stress inside the particles of the, um, of the bird or the ice. And therefore, it behaves like a hydrodynamic. So we use uh, the existing uh, codes uh, using SPH technology, for example. It could be Lagrangian or Eulerian. But there are several methods of doing it. We understand the bird material. But the material for the ice, we don't have a good model. And we need to do a lot of testing before we say that this ice cube will give you this sort of damage to the part uh, is something which is doing, done experimentally today. So we need to be spending a lot of time in, in assessing the, 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 quality, the, the quality of the, uh, the, the quality of the, uh, the, the model, uh, mathematical model of the ice, ice, ice material. So you can see that. Uh, uh, the, 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 the question, therefore, associated with that is you, you design the part to withstand, uh, to withstand uh, the impact of the bird or the ice. But can you not avoid birds from the airport? Uh, we are now trying to do use the drones to carry uh, lasers, to carry, uh, uh, to carry, for example, chemicals, and to spray them. Uh, outside the, uh, the airport bubble, uh, a safe distance, and to avoid uh, 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 possible bird menace into the airport. And there are several technologies. The challenge is we, somebody uh, should take up this as a project for uh, sanitizing airports and reduce the menace of birds. So the development of ice material modeling, modification of the Johnson Cook parameters for this, and high strain rate behavior of this material is a basic necessity. And we can also use um, uh, uh, the anti-icing, uh, instead of allowing the ice to build up on the parts and get them sucked into the engine if it becomes too big, we, it is possible uh, to have an uh, onboard system which will uh, predict the, the layer of ice which is forming. And as soon as it goes to, say, half a millimeter, uh, it, there are det the sensors we detect it. And we can use the actuator, smart actuators and smart sensors to uh, shake the, the small little layer of ice and then so protect the whole aircraft or the engine uh, from being uh, disabled by uh, formation of thick blocks of ice around this. So we have, uh, we can take the course to um, uh, artificial intelligence, the smart sensors and technologies for this. And then today we are talking about I'll skip some of these things. Today we are talking about um, health monitoring. Health monitoring of the engine is important today. We must be able to predict 
What is the life that's left out of the engine after 2000 hours of operation? Uh, which part has got damaged too much? And today, is it safe to run for another thousand hours is a question. And for this, we have systems which, uh, which with sensors on the engine, which feedback and the algorithm, the, the signal goes to the algorithm and we are able to find out because we know the material, we know the tree fatigue and impact behavior. And therefore we can predict the life that is available, life that's been spent. And this is happening uh, for a very long time. Today, we understand this, this, this system very well. Our technology readiness level in this particular area is quite high, but we need a lot of sensors to uh, get in into the engine system if you want to do an advanced contemporary uh, fifth generation aircraft. We need the sensors which can look at vibration, which can look at um, the, uh, the temperature and uh, and, the, and the strains on the blades. We are talking about thin film sensors, which are sensors which are built as a part of the blade itself. They are not external sensors which are struck on the blades, but they are built in into the engine system and then the component system. And we also have to develop high-speed telemetry and, of course, the, uh, a brief, brief description of the thin film. We've been trying this for a very, very long time. And I'm sure with the help of uh, agencies like IIT, IIT Chennai and several other academic institutes, we should be able to pull our resources and be able to develop these thin film sensors without which it will be very difficult for us to look at the health monitoring of the engine. We should also be able to have systems which will look at warn us about the number of particles which are likely to get in. Can we relate it to the erosion characteristics and so on? And we have today a, com a reasonable comfort level in looking at the turbine blade temperatures from optical sensors placed outside. They are non-invasive. But can that be used for vibration measurement? Can, can it be related to the, 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 the so-called radial and circumferential pattern factor? And this is the question. And all this put together, we should be able to build uh, engine life uh, health and usage monitoring. And that is today going on in a, in a diagnostics-based tool. We, we look at what is the data that's coming in, we use the data, milk the data, and put it into system and say, look, this engine, this part is now in, 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 in at the edge, edge of its uh, life. But uh, today, we must have a prognostics-based health management system, which is without which we have no engine of the future. So this is something which we must develop, and the development of thin film sensors non-invasive optical temperature sensors, prognostics-based life and health monitoring system is a must, is a, 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 an unavoidable thing. So this is something which I wanted to tell. Another five minutes, I'll try to finish as much as I can, and I don't mind stopping uh, at 11 o'clock at that, and we, we can take a call on that. Now, we, we have learned from the civilian application. We have plenty of um, turbo props which are required. We have uh, done a lot of work on propellers for helicopters, but we don't have a dedicated group. We don't have technology in the country to look at ab initio development of propellers of different types and manufacture them and operate them and repair them. The MRO for propellers uh, are not there uh, in the sufficient quantity and our TRL is quite low. If you look at the estimate that, that's been done, we are looking at a huge number of turboprops all over the country uh, in terms of civilian, in terms of even defense applications for propellers are required. And today we have seen uh, how elsewhere these turboprops are making a big draw in terms of technology and engine systems. And they are, these propellers are not only for our Turbo props and uh, uh, for defense application, but also for uh, seaplanes. Seaplanes are basically, though we are, we are using today gas turbines for seaplanes, we are also using propellers for uh, the, the amphibians and our crafts. So there's huge potential, but we need, therefore, uh, technology based to be de developed in terms of basic design, manufacture. Then the, today we are talking about manufacturing blades and propellers out of, out of composite materials out of um, uh, lightweight material with leading edge protection for erosion and so on. Therefore, there are, there are a lot of issues. I'll skip this because of time, uh, but we are now talking about uh, use of smart materials inside the engine. And the smart materials today are limited by temperature, but can we make use of uh, smart materials which are slightly higher temperature and they can be used conveniently, comfortably all over the engine to 
to do geometric control to increase the efficiency of the system, flow control seals, and picking up vibration and noise and so on. This is a, a strategy uh, about 10 years old, but we have not done any progress on this issue. And we are now today talking about more electric or almost all electric engine, where the accessories are driven by, uh, by motors, electric motors, and not through uh, gear driven systems, which need a lot of lubrication, oil, oil sum, heat exchangers, and so on. So if you have motor driven, electric motor driven accessories, uh, and also a generator, which can give you enough energy for powering the aircraft, it will be a wonderful thing to happen. And mind you, we also have magnetic bearings, which, are, uh, which will throw away the need for uh, lubrication of the bearings, oil less uh, bearings, for the engine system. And this is truly the fifth generation system in aircraft. And already you have seen, I'm sure most of you would have seen this, uh, there is a Rolls-Royce initiative. We, have, we are having a, 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 an aircraft uh, which is electric driven, which means the propellers are driven by the electric motors and all other control surfaces are generated uh, uh, based on generation done, done up. Now today we are talking about future generation engine system. There are a lot of um, aerodynamically variable cycle systems, which are, which are very, very important to have in the future. And I'm sure agencies like IIT Madras, uh, which is celebrating RSD today, uh, should be able to look at SIGAP. And I'm sure a lot of work is going on, but there are a lot of aerodynamic concepts, uh, future engines, variable cycle, uh, turbofans, uh, big nozzle ejectors, and so on. So that's possible to do today. Uh, we have um, a map, which is uh, the first initiative of Rolls-Royce, which set up um, a lot of technology centers, uh, uh, Rolls-Royce technology centers in universities all over Europe and the US. And this is a model which has been fairly successful. And this is, of course, has expanded. And I'm sure IIT Madras also enjoys the company of Rolls-Royce through another technology center here for a very short uh, focused area. But we need to have similar thing for uh, Indian context. We have a center of excellence on gas turbines. I'm sure IIT Chennai, IIT Madras, and IIT Bombay are partners in this. We had uh, what is called, we have a still going on program. I mean, programs are going on. Gas turbine advanced materials, GT map, which of course is centered out of ISC, like law. And gas turbine enabling technology, we ran uh, two or three programs, uh, two programs, in fact, uh, from uh, DRW, GTRE. And there are several smaller, the very, very small fraction of activity under air and DB, which is not a very good sign. And we uh, we need to therefore uh, set up a lot of gas turbine technical centers, uh, one of which is already uh, operational at the address. We need to expand the scale of operation. This is only symbolic. We will not reach where we want to, unless this is gone many, many, many times more, uh, more, more we have to do. And therefore, we look at uh, summarily uh, for fifth generation fighter engines and small gas turbines are the in thing. We, we have a big, big tension, a need for it. Huge technology gap exists between what is required and what is really available today. The TRLs are a huge gap, and we need to uh, plug this as much as possible. A, des a, a design and development of a new engine in five years, seven years is a daydream unless we reduce this gap. This is something which is fundamental. We are all doing a very, very big mistake in not having infrastructure, uh, technology-based develop quickly. And therefore, we need to launch multi-level R&D programs. There are good opportunities, there are associated challenges and huge risks. And therefore, we all need to put our hands together and see how this technology gaps can be. It's not enough if you fund an engine program. You need to fund basic infrastructure development programs, which can be 10 times more. And this is something which is, we, we made a mistake and we continue doing it. So more number of technology centers at academic institutes like we have today uh, should be uh, in, initiated. And we need to have a very comprehensive technology plugging uh, initiatives we, uh, started early, at least parallelly, if not um, preemptively, we need to do, if you have to really do what is required for future fifth generation, sixth generation engines. So this is my experience. I, I, I pardon, I mean, I beg your pardon for rushing this through because I just wanted to convey um, our experience in every um, uh, quick manner within an hour. It's very difficult to do that, but I'm sure you will appreciate, uh, you'll understand what I wanted to have. And with this, I end my this presentation. I took a little more time than what I should. Mm -hmm. And I thank again, once again, 
um, the um, dean, I mean, academic research um, uh, uh, dean, the Madras in particular, in general, and of course the team which which uh, helped me to uh, facilitated this discussion on the technology challenges in advanced aircraft engines. And of course, a, a special thanks to um, Dr. Gupta and of course, uh, Dr. Tanurajan for enabling this. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, yes, sir. Uh, this is Tanurajan. Uh, yeah. so thank you so much, sir, uh, for, your, for your acceptance uh, for our RSD 21 edition and uh, for our celebration, uh, Research Scholars Day. Yeah. And uh, you have provided a lot variety of uh, technologies which is available in India and uh, as well as in global for the aero engine fraternity and um, the uh, high speed aircrafts and uh, aero engines and jet engines. Right. And uh, many of our uh, students, research scholars, uh, yeah. have put in uh, many questions uh, yeah. on the way in the YouTube channel. And uh, uh, one of one or two questions I would like to put in before close the session. Yeah. Uh, one is FOD is the one of the enemy for the engines. So right. to control uh, uh, the, that part, uh, which is the technology is available in our countries sir, uh, that you can slightly put on. Right. Uh, well, actually, uh, there is um, uh, the requirement, uh, there is a stringent requirement for bird strike requirements for the aero engines. And the requirement is that we should absorb 13 small, if you take a, a G404 or a recovery engine type of engine, uh, 13 small engines are small birds of, of 110 grams and two medium sized birds, 0.8 kilograms, and one uh, two, two kilogram, 1.8 kilogram bird should be sucked into the engine, should be allowed to get into the engine and demonstrate that the engine will simply not disintegrate. It will not structurally disintegrate. It will uh, pro provide thrust for a short while and not conk out immediately. But for small gas, small birds, it shall not have structural integrity problem. It will continue with reduced thrust of about 85%. This is the requirement. So this is basically, and the technology that we have today is the ability to simulate uh, the impact of birds. Bird, as I said, is a small, uh, is, is a hydrodynamic material, including feathers and everything put together. They behave like, at those speeds, like, uh, like um, uh, hydrodynamic uh, material and fluid. Uh, at those, temperature, uh, those uh, speeds. And uh, the, the ability to simulate the impact of these uh, uh, um, birds on rotating and static uh, parts has been well understood. And we have uh, simulated using di Dytron, uh, 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 the, the ANSYS um, uh, software. We are able to predict this. And today we also have facility in the, in the, in the, in the, in the, in the laboratories in India uh, to look at uh, for testing with static parts and rotating parts in static condition. And we also have a facility in the system in the country uh, where you can spin the fan, for example, and fire birds, uh, all the types of birds, medium, large, and small size. In fact, we have uh, ability to fire small birds in clusters into the engine and demonstrate that structurally the behavior of the, of the blades and the nose cone uh, is not going to be so bad that it will result in a, in a, in a, in a, in a what shall we say, in a disaster. Yeah, yeah. Uh, shutdown of the engine. And that because we are able to relate the distorted blades with the aerodynamic performance of the fan and the fan uh, behavior is related to the performance of the whole engine. So we are able to do that today. And in fact, we have been doing this test for uh, even some OEMs like uh, for example, Honeywell, we did do that. The only thing that we don't have is testing the whole engine with these bird guns uh, which we uh, intend to do elsewhere. So the technology-wise, we have the ability to simulate, ability to predict uh, the, the damage, ability to predict the aerodynamic performance, and also carry out the tests in the country, in the, in the labs in the country, uh, at the component level. But at the engine level, we need to be dependent on the systems abroad. So this is the technology as far as the bird is, bird, it is concerned. We also have the same ability to do uh, slab, ice slab and ice cubes and ice spheres, and also sand and water ingestion. And so this is uh, easily done uh, from simulation, but we need to demonstrate for certification this ability of the engine to withstand bird, ice, sand, 
water. At least four different types of uh, uh, films. The question is, there is a big controversy about this. Uh, the engine in the, in the LCA, for example, it sits at the back, and there are uh, side intakes which are S curved, and therefore the, the 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 debate. I mean, this is something which is technically important thing for people to understand. When you have a two kg, one kg, one point eight kg bird going, it first hits the intake wall, and obviously it will disintegrate and go at an angle to the engine. It won't go uh, like in a winged um, engine uh, in the transport aircraft. The bird goes direct onto the aircraft engine. But here, it's going through the, the fuselage, in a, through the intake. And the debate is, what is the maximum size and the velocity of the sized chunk uh, which goes into the engine? That needs to be assessed. So this debate is going on. So we don't have a good answer. But the worst case scenario is to assume that the whole thing goes straight into the engine, which is worst case scenario. I think they are going to overkill. And therefore the analysis that's going on is, what is the probabilistic uh, velocity, the size and the shape of the bird which goes into the engine and at what angle it enters? It won't be axial to the engine. Because as I mentioned, I showed you the clip or the, the, the slide, where the engine sits at the back and two side uh, S-curve, S intakes go and supply air to the engine. So the engine will not get a uh, 2 kg or 1.8 kg bird direct at the same velocity, takeoff velocity. It will be reduced mass of non descript uh, shape and at not the same uh, angle. So the uh, whole these things are being simulated through, um, through the, the software, the ANSYS mm -hmm. software, um, I mean, uh, the Dytron uh, software. And this is uh, something which is. Uh, uh, is to required to be decided before we uh, put the engine for certification. Thank you, sir. Thank you. And uh, uh, there are a lot of variety of questions, uh, which uh, we will uh, connect with you by mail, sir. Our researchers uh, yeah. and uh, paternity and aero engines and uh, aero society people. So, uh, right. Thank you so much, sir. Uh, no, I, I, I must thank apologize. You. I must apologize for, first of all, I rushed the whole thing through. But uh, yes. thank you. Thank you for the opportunity. And I'd be really glad to look at, the, uh, to, to look at all the questions and uh, make a suitable response to those things. And I, you know, I'm free to uh, be uh, to be associated with any one of the uh, students or uh, research scholars or any faculty member for a further dialogue on this issue. Thank you. Thank you very much, and again for this opportunity.